Hi everyone, I'm back. Um, so today we're going to take a look at a challenge that Mara Baz posted on Twitter uh, three days ago. Uh, she's a library team lead for Rust, and the challenge was make a Rust program that outputs A, but after running cargo format outputs B instead. Uh, it was a very fun challenge. I actually came up with two different solutions for it, and we're going to go through what it takes for a program to do that, what is Rust format, all that stuff. And then we're going to take a look at my first solution, which is kind of cheating. And then the second solution, which is a lot more fun. And a lot, a lot of people upon seeing it were either like, oh no, oh, oh no, why did you do this? Uh, and the other half was like, what, what is even happening here? I don't get it. Um, so we're going to, we're going to explain <laughs> all of that. Um, First, we need to kind of explain what Rust format is or cargo format, the, the same thing. Um, so let's say I, I have a statement like this, like let's uh, let x equals one plus and then a bunch of spaces and then five. Um, this is not great. There's a bunch of extra spaces in there. We don't really want like this in our code. We want the code to look nice and tidy. Um, so what we can do is just run cargo format and it's just going to remove the extra spaces. And it does a bunch of things like this. If I put the brace on the wrong line, for example, and then run format, it's also going to fix that. If I put a line break where it doesn't belong, it's also going to fix that. Now I'm going to show you the first solution I came up with, which um, is cheating a little bit, and we'll go through why it is cheating. First, let's make sure that it works. So if we run cargo run, you can see that it prints A, and you run cargo run again, it prints B. So it works, it qualifies as a solution for the challenge, but it's kind of cheating. It is kind of cheating because it is using include stir. You know, let's unpack this. So file is going to be src slash main.rs. Um, and then we are concatenating this with the prefix that you use when you want the parent directory of something. So now let's, you know, let's add the include stir in there, see what happens. And sure enough, it prints our code, comments at all. And then what it does is it slices it. It takes everything after 64, and that ends up being in the middle of this word, which has A and B right next to each other. And then we're slicing again so that it only takes one character. So that prints B. And the way I made it print A originally is I was kind of sneaky. I just added a space here and here. So there's still a line. So if you're looking at this from far away, you see these and you're like, yeah, that, that looks a line. That's fine. So this one prints A because it's uh, because of the space, it's reaching that A here. And then you format it and everything moves to the left. And then it prints B. So I was pretty happy with the solution because it has a load bearing comment. Uh, I think macabre is just a fun word. And also like I, I, I didn't actually use 64, I used two shifts to the left five times. But that was not, you know, in the spirit of the challenge. The spirit of the challenge is find a Rust format bug that you like, and then find a way to make a program around it that prints A and then you format and then it prints B. And so that's what my second solution was. So the bug that I picked for this is CFG feature is removed when feature name is too long. Here, here's what the repro case looks like. This looks pretty innocent, right? You have, you have a single parameter in that F function named X, uh, and it, it only exists if that feature is turned on. So if you added this crate as a dependency, you could turn on that feature, and then that would make that parameter exist. But if you didn't, it, it wouldn't be there. So you effectively have two versions of F here. You have one that doesn't take any parameters and one that takes X of type U64. But if you run cargo format on that, it removes the CFG attributes. I saw that and was like, well, that definitely changes the meaning of the code, which is the kind of Rust format bugs you want for that challenge. But how the heck do you make that print A or B? One idea I had is, can we somehow detect from inside the function how many arguments we have, uh, whether this X argument is present or not? And it's harder than you'd think. Currently, uh, by default, that feature is not turned on, I think. So if I try to print X, yeah, it's going to complain. Like, X does not exist. And the only way we can call F is with no arguments. If we try to give it an argument, it does not work. And if we go in cargo format, it's the other way around. Now suddenly, this works and this works, but this no longer works. And the second challenge was, how do we know that the argument is there? Because we can't use it because when it's not there, it's just going to error out. So first I tried something with traits. So here's the thing about traits. You can have two traits like this. 
right? They both have a foo method that takes self. And that type implements both of those traits, and then you can call foo, right? No, because there's multiple applicable items in scope. So we're pretty much back to square one, where we have this function that sometimes has no arguments and sometimes has one argument, and we want to be able to call it no matter what. And this, this is kind of where the crimes come in. Here's the thought. What if we could cast this function to some other type that we can always call because it's the same type? So the trick here is to cast it to this type right here, which is a pointer to an empty tuple. And then we transmute that, because now we have the address of the function, into another function type. And now we can call it in uh, both cases. So this is with x, this is without x. So now we need a way to figure out from inside the function whether the argument exists or not. And that is harder than you think it is. Let's say, for instance, we want to print the address of x, maybe. Well, we can't do that before formatting because the feature is not turned on, so this actually does not exist. But what if we had arguments before x and after x? And instead of trying to manipulate this argument here, we're going to try to manipulate these, which are always there, but sometimes separated by something in the middle, and that's kind of the core of the solution. Now in this code, we're printing the address of L and the address of R. It prints these. All right, the difference is eight, which is what we expected. So now I guess we can save our code, run cargo format, and then run it again, or we could just, you know, comment out this. So the offset is still eight. The problem we're having here is that observing something is changing it. And I'm gonna show you why. Okay, so now we're taking the address of M and printing it right here. And now the offset is 16. And you might be thinking, oh, maybe it's, maybe it's just optimizing, you know, the argument away because it knows that you never use it. Um, but that's not what's happening at all. Because if we just print M itself, not the address of M, but just M, like so, then nope, that still is 16. Um, I think what's happening here is that println is actually format under the hood and format is taking the address of m anyway. So really what we want to we do is copy m to something else first. There, now the offset is eight, even though we clearly read the value of m. What makes a difference here is whether or not we take the address of m, which is interesting for a bunch of different reasons. To understand why taking the address of m matters, we need to think about how arguments are passed to function. Okay, so here we have two functions. We have a function called g, which is not mangled, so it's going to be easier to find the symbol in the executable. And all it does is call f with three different values. And then we have a function called f that takes three arguments. It takes the address of l and r, and then it just returns the difference between those addresses. So g is pretty straightforward. Uh, it just saves the value of racks on the stack. And then it moves the first argument into RDI, so we're going to take notes here. And then the second argument, it goes into ESI, and the third argument is in EDX. You can see that it matches here, and then we call F here, and then we just restore the value of racks that we saved up here from the stack, and we just return. It's a very nice, very simple function. I like it. Uh, now let's disassemble F to see what it does. So F is a bit more involved. There's a, there's a bunch of things going on. Uh, so the first thing it does is reserve a bunch of space on the stack. Then it starts copying arguments on to the stack as well. Uh, so it's reading L, it's putting L into offset 0x10, which is just 16. Then it's reading from RDX, which is R at 0x18, which is 24. And then it's reading from RSI, which is M, and it's storing that on the stack at offset 0x20, which is 32. So you can see that we get the arguments through registers, EDI, ESI, and EDX, but then we move them immediately onto the stack, and it just so happens that R and L are 8 bytes apart. And I think that's because if we were using L, M, and R in order, they might be separated by 8 bytes each. But because we only use L and R, it's just putting, like, first it's putting L because we need it, then R, and then also M because, like, it's, it's just part of the function. We just need to put it somewhere. So how do we prevent that from happening? How do we make L and R have stable addresses? Well, we need to look at the ABI for Linux on x86-64. 
So the ABI uses registers RDI, RSI, RDX, RCX, R8, and R9, and then it uses the stack if there's any more arguments. So what if we just add six dummy arguments in front so that they use the registers? Then whatever arguments we have after that have to be passed through the stack in order. That should allow us to actually tell where the arguments after the six initial ones are. I've changed up F a little bit so that it has the six padding arguments that I've named after the registers that they should be passed in. And then we have our three arguments here, which should be passed on the stack. And then I've changed G as well, so that it passes zero for all the register arguments and our usual signal values for L, M, and R. So now if we build that and disassemble G, we should see that it's clearing racks because it's, it's a fast way to obtain a zero here. And then it's moving it into R9 that one, and then just copying R9 to RDI, RSI, RDX, RCX, and R8. So it's passing zeros to all of these, and then it is moving our values here, 0x1111, one, 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 to the stack at offset 0 here, uh, and then 2 at offset 8, and 3 at offset 16, and then calling F. So now if we disassemble F, we can see that again, it's a debug build, so it's preserving a bunch of stack space for no good reason. Um, but then, eventually, it's loading something from the stack out of set 0x50, which is eight apart from that, which it just reserved. So it's not part of the space it just reserved on the stack, it's part of the arguments. Um, so it's loading the address of that argument and then this argument, and this these are respectively L and R, and you can see that on the stack, they are 0x10 apart, aka 16. So now, because we're returning that difference here from f and then again from g, if we call it from main and print the value, we should see 16 right now. Yes, and we do. Um, but if we remove m, then we should see 8. So that works. So now, how do we use that to print a or b? Well, Really, the rest of the solution is just, I don't know, I wanted to obfuscate it a little bit, make it a little bit poetic. Uh, so you can look at the full solution, it's going to be a link in the description. But really, all we need to do here is, well, first we need to call f like this. And it, it doesn't matter what the value of any of these are. Uh, th these could be anything. So we're just going to clean up our code a little bit here. Uh, this one is going to need the attributes that disappears, like so. And then we just call f like this. And we need to take the value here. And then I guess we could just have a match. We also want to change the signature here so that it actually returns a u64. And yeah, this is this is the base of the solution right here. So if we run it, it prints a because this does not actually exist because the feature is not enabled. So l and r are next to each other in the stack, and they're both eight bytes. So the offset between these two is eight. Um, but if we format, then this this uh, attribute disappears, and now L and R separated by M, which is also 8 bytes, so the difference is 16, and if we cargo run, we print B. That was a very fun challenge, I really enjoyed it. Uh, thanks Mara for putting this up. Uh, if you enjoyed this video, please like, comment, and subscribe. I'd like to thank my patrons for making videos like these possible. Uh, you can throw me $5 a month or $10 a month on patreon.com slash lime if you so choose. And I hope you have a great day and until next time, take care.